Look, y'all, we could just, can we play that again, please? Just, just that last part. That I got proof right there. I'm no longer a six in her book. I am a 10 plus. Those of you who know our story, you know what that means. Uh, one, two, three. These were the fingers and the numbers that I saw my five-year-old daughter, Brienne, throwing up with enthusiasm and pride yesterday as we were at the Blair Complex. She was playing soccer. Now, a lot of people looking around might not have had an understanding or an idea of why my daughter was throwing her little tiny cute fingers up in the air. And at one point, her coach had pulled her kind of collectively in the group and asked, hey, what are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm just counting the number of goals because dad says if we get three goals, I get two donuts. <laughs> Reminded me about motivation. That we're all motivated. We all have different motivators in our lives. And motivation in and of itself isn't a bad thing. What motivates us is something that we have to be honest about and give strong consideration to. Today, as we kick off a brand new series over the next seven weeks, we're going to round out uh, a, a bigger study that we've been in through the Gospel of John. We started over two months ago with the first of seven messages entitled Signs, where we looked at the miracles of Jesus. And then we did a seven-week series that we looked at critical conversations that Jesus had. We are now stepping into a seven-week series where we are going to look at the teachings of Jesus. There are four Gospels presented in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what are known as parallel accounts of the gospel. In other words, similar stories, similar examples. John, though consistent with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, takes a little bit of a different perspective and speaks to a little bit of a different audience. Written between A.D. 70 and A.D. 100, John, the son of Zebedee, who is an apostle of Jesus, who did life and ministry with Jesus, writes his gospel from a perspective of wanting to show concrete evidence as examples to both Jews and Gentiles for not only the purpose of Jesus, but the person of Jesus. So we have been collectively studying these seven miracles or signs, seven critical conversations, and now seven teachings of Jesus so that we can understand the person, the purpose, and the passions of Jesus and how it matters to our lives today. Let me invite you right up front to grab your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible this morning, one of my friends is coming around right now and they would love to gift you a Bible. All you need to do is raise your hand and let them know that you would like one. We're going to be in John chapter 6. If you're looking for John, you can find it at the table of contents at the front of your Bible or a little more than two-thirds of the way through your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then you'll get to John. John chapter 6, as we begin this study, this series, through the teachings of Jesus. I did some research this last week into teaching and the critical nature of teaching. I did not realize, some of you probably will, we have multiple educators in our congregation, but there are actually 12 different methods or ways that people learn with four primary. The four primary are auditory or what you hear, visual or what you see, kinesthetic or what you do, and then words, what you see written down or what you write out. Those are four primary ways that teachers educate us and help us understand. What I love about the teachings of Jesus is he encompasses each and every one of these methods or modes. And I don't think that it was systematic, but he cares so much that you and I get the gospel that he teaches it to us in a way that matters and that makes sense. And today we're going to jump in in a brand new series that will take us seven more weeks through the Gospel of John as we look at the teachings of Jesus. Now, we're calling this series I Am because Jesus is going to give seven different teachings about who he is, revealing even more the person, the purpose, and the passions of Jesus. We're going to investigate this and then investigate even further how it applies 
applies to our life today and what it means for us individually, what it means for us collectively. And I am excited to jump in this morning as we start off by looking at motivation because I truly believe every one of us is motivated by something and hopefully someone and our motivation is what matters most. We're going to start our time in prayer and then we're going to jump right into John chapter 6. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for Reach Church. I thank you for this time and this opportunity that we have to sit together and to hear from your word, to rightly divide your word, and to grow because of your word. Now pray now that as we spend the next few minutes together studying, that you would illuminate our minds. Help us to see clearly from scripture what you want us to see. Lord, I pray that I would literally be nothing more than conduit. Use me as an ambassador, as a herald, as a spokesperson to speak your truth that I would preach today with authenticity and accuracy in a way that matters and makes sense, that we can apply to our lives so that we can grow not only in knowledge, but in understanding and in living out our life in you. And I pray today that the words of my mouth and that the meditations of our hearts would be received as a gift, holy and pleasing to you alone, our Lord and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, John chapter 6, beginning in verse 22, and we're going to spend our time together today reading through verse 40 together, looking at John chapter 6, beginning in verse 22. Here is what we read. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. What is the next day in reference to? Well, if you look at the gospel of John prior to this, immediately preceding this, Jesus is with his disciples. They have gathered together collectively to celebrate the Passover. This is where God redeems the people of Israel as they are fleeing captivity from Israel. There is a lot of symbolism and celebration and recognition that goes with this. And pilgrims will make their way from all over the place to celebrate this as one of many festivals or feasts where they come together collectively at the temple for celebration. As people are coming, they have come with their people, they have come with their family, they've come with whatever means they have There's a collection of individuals, the Bible records 5,000 men, that Jesus will meet with. And there he realizes that they have a real physical need for food. The Bible gives us an example of how Jesus will feed 5,000. But we know to be true that these individuals would have traveled with their families and there was only a census or an account given of the men. So it's likely that there were upwards of as many as 20,000 people that Jesus feeds at this time. At this miracle, the people are so overwhelmed with enthusiasm and excitement about this miraculous move of Jesus that they gather together and they devise a plan to force Jesus to become king of their community. Jesus, knowing full well what they're thinking, he will retreat away from the people because the Bible says his time had not yet come and he will get alone and he will pray to the Father. The people then begin to gather. Jesus sends his disciples into the boats back over the Sea of Galilee to the far northern shore where they were in Tiberias. They're headed now to Capernaum. The next morning, Jesus arrives with them, but he did not arrive by boat. He he arrived miraculously. We know this to be walking on water, which is a critical miracle for the disciples In a lot of ways, it validates even more the truth of who he is in their lives. So when it says the next day, this is all that has unfolded previously. We see now the next day, the crowd, this is the the 20,000 people that had seen for themselves and experienced for themselves this miracle of Jesus, had stayed on the far shore in Tiberias. They saw that the disciples had taken the only boat. It's important that we understand that John recalls that it's the only boat because there's nothing tricky about this miracle of Jesus walking on water. There was only one way that he would have been able to get there because there was only one boat that they took. They noticed and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Verse 23 says, several boats from Tiberias, which is the, 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 the southwest part of the Sea of Galilee, several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So now you got people coming because they're hearing all the more about this miracle. Verse 24 gives us some insight into what happens next. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there. They got into the boats and they went across to Capernaum to look for him. Would you circle or underline look for him? Highlight that. Point out 
in your own Bible that these people had come intentionally looking for Jesus. There's a motivation to what they are looking for, but we see here that they are looking for Jesus. In verse 25, it says, they found him, Jesus, on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now, looking for Jesus, this should tell us the critical nature that each one of us has to search for something of significance. These people had heard about Jesus. These people had experienced Jesus' miraculous feeding of the flock. These people were looking for something more in their lives. So many songs have been written about searching, searching for someone or searching for something. One of the greatest albums ever recorded is by U2. It's known as Joshua Tree. And the song that is paramount on that album says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. It speaks to the true nature of every one of us looking for significance, looking for something more. We see this in scripture, but I want to show you how God answers each one of us in our search. A lot of us, if you were to take a straw poll and I were to ask you if you know what Jeremiah 29, 11 says, you may have memorized this. For now the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But I want to read this together. Take your finger, keep it here on John chapter 6 and flip halfway through your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, and we are going to begin reading in verse 11, which is what I just shared with you. But I want to take it even further because it speaks to the heart and the nature of God and people who are searching for him. Jeremiah 29, here's the prophet Jeremiah speaking to the nation of Israel in captivity at that time. In verse 11, these people are struggling with significance and what they're searching for. And here is the word of God. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Hard stop. This preaches really well. It looks really good embroidered on pillows. It looks really nice on coffee mugs in the morning. It's a, it's a scripture of hope, and it lets us know that God wants good things for us. But do you know culturally and contextually that the Israelites are literally in captivity as slaves at this time? I would argue that things might not be any worse for the people of Israel at the time that they're receiving this word. So how does it read to them? They're being held captive. They've been forced from their land. They are serving a king that is not their king. They've lost everything that they have known to be true of their identity. And then God shows up on the scene to the people through the prophet Jeremiah who says, I have good things in store for you. He's not speaking of what they might be experiencing in that moment, but he is speaking of the promise that he has, which shows us even more the person, the nature of God. Look at verse 12. It says, in those days when you pray, I will listen. Now, verse 13, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. What I love about this is the promise that even in the midst of life's most difficult circumstances, when we search for God, not, hap not haphazardly, but with intentionality, with our whole heart, that we will find him, we will experience him, we will see him. Here, going back to John chapter 6 now, in verse 24, 25, we see again that the crowds, they saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there. They got into the boats and they went across to Capernaum to look for him. There is a motivation behind what they're doing. They are searching for significance, but they don't yet know the nature of their search. And in verse 25, it says, they found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, how did you get here? When did you get here? I love that even in this simple reminder that God uses the circumstances of their situation to remind the people that if they search out God wholeheartedly, they will find him. So the question that we have to begin asking ourselves this morning as we dive into this together is, what are we in search of? 
Better yet, who are we in search of? Every one of us is searching. We're searching. We're searching for significance. We're searching for someone. We're searching for something. We're searching for answers. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're in search of answers because you're faced with a medical crisis right now. Maybe you're here because you've reached the bottom of the proverbial barrel and you're searching for significance because the barrels that you've been searching in have left you void and empty. Maybe you're, you're searching for answers. You've gone through religion much of your life, but you know that there's more to it. There's got to be more to it than just going through the religious rituals and motions. The promise of God, and we see this in his teaching, is that when we search him out, we will find him. But the caveat is that we search with our whole heart. We've got to be committed to the search. These people are searching for Jesus. Verse 26, Jesus is going to speak to motivation. Remember I said that motivation isn't bad, but motivation matters. Jesus replied in verse 26, I tell you the truth. Now, anytime that you read in scripture, verily, verily, I say to you, or truly, truly, I say to you, or as it reads in the New Living Translation, I tell you the truth, it should draw a distinction between what people have heard before and what they're hearing now. What Jesus is going to speak to isn't a lie that they've heard before, but a motivation that they have allowed to inform and influence their lives. He's going to speak directly now to motivations. Jesus grabs their attention. He says, listen, I need you to pay attention. Wake up and focus on what I'm about to say, Jesus says. I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. They were there with Jesus. They were there with the disciples. This massive crowd of 20,000 people were there when this innocent boy coming home from a long day of labor had but just a few measly offerings of fish and, and, and some crackers, some barley crackers. When the disciples came down and asked what was in this basket, he offered it up. There Jesus miraculously fed the masses. The disciples went around and they collected 12 baskets that were full, left over, showing God's provision. Jesus is calling out their motivations. He's saying, look, I want to tell you the truth. I want you to know that I understand why you're truly here. The answer to your question, we're going to get to in a minute, but we first must address the real nature of your question. Why are you here? In other words, what are you doing? I experienced this firsthand this last week as people, we, we intrinsically, we look for ulterior motives. We're looking for the real reason behind something, even in our faith. I was out with our youth pastor, Russell, this last week as we were getting ready for an amazing fifth quarter youth event that we did in partnership with the, the YMCA. I, I hear that they had over 120 junior high and high school kids that came out and got to watch the game together outside and got to play all kinds of activities together and that it was an absolute blast to the YMCA and to anybody who helped make that happen. I say thank you so much. It was an amazing event. Awesome. <laughs> While Russell and I were out in Omaha getting supplies and getting ready, we stopped at the, the, the place of the Lord, otherwise known as Chipotle. <laughs> now, I need to help you understand why we went to Chipotle. Apparently, my son told me that there's a new Chipotle by the brand new Top Golf, and we felt that it was incumbent upon us to be your cupbearers. We wanted to go and make sure that it was quality and that you would get the same level of service there as you would at any of the other Chipotles. There's now four in the greater Omaha. Ask me, I'll tell you where they're all at. And I assure you, they did not disappoint. While we were at Chipotle, we went outside to eat and there was a man standing at the door who was waiting for his food and he, he was standing there and the, the, the manager came out and said, here's your food. The card that you gave us, it was a gift card, it didn't work, but we want you to have this food anyway. And as this man started to walk away, both Russell and I looked down and noticed that 
he literally was walking out of his shoes. They were being held together by shoestrings and kind of tied together in a, in a funky manner so that the material that had wrapped his foot wouldn't fall off completely. In a moment, Russell jumped up from the table and he hopped over, like I would have done 20 years ago, this, this guardrail, and he chased this man down and he said, what size shoe do you wear? And this man looked at Russell and looked at his shoes and he said, uh, 12? And Russell said, oh man, I'm a 10 and a half. And they started this conversation. The guy said, well, why do you want to know what size shoe I wear? Russell said, hey, come on and have lunch with us. I want to sit, I just want to just come have lunch with us. This man made his way back through uh, the, the side of where we were sitting and together for over an hour, we sat and we learned about this man's story. We heard his, his life story and we, we really just got to spend some time getting to know him. This is Nicholas. And as Russell and I sat there talking to Nicholas, we both were overcome with this strong desire to be able to provide for him. So we said, hey, hey man, look, here's what we want to do. Hang out here. We're going to run to Dick's Sporting Goods, which is right across the street. And we are gonna, we're going to get you some shoes. Would that be okay? And he said, uh, yeah, sure. And so we said, look, if you stay here, I promise we'll be back in a half an hour and, and we have some shoes for you. So Russell and I jumped in my car. We ran to Dick's Sporting Goods. We got him a really nice pair of, of quality walking shoes and a, a big old bag of, I think, a 12-count pack of socks. And we came back. And sure enough, he was sitting there with his food, just sitting right in the middle of one of those tables, waiting. And as we got back, we handed him this bag with the shoes and he opened it up and he tried them on and he just began walking from one side to the next. And he, he, he said, well, I guess I don't need these anymore. And he threw these other shoes away in the garbage. And then as we stood there, we didn't even sit down. As we stood there, he looked right at Russell and he said, why would you do this? You don't know me. What's, what's your motivation? He literally asked, What's in this for you? Why would you do this for me? We had over lunch talked about philosophy. At one point in this young man's life, he was a philosophy major at University of Nebraska, Omaha, and we began to hear the tragedy of his story and listen to him share about his faith. And I jumped in the back of my car. We had just come off of a staff retreat. Our leaders, our staff, our elders had got, uh, had the opportunity to go away for three days to pray and to process and to plan for 2021, what we feel like God's calling us to. And so I had a journal in the back of my car and I had a Bible in the back of my car and I had a pen that was just sitting there. I reached back and I grabbed the Bible and the pen and, the, and, and, and I opened it up and Russell and I right there, we, looked, we turned to Matthew 22, 36 and 37. And we pointed to it right here and we said, this is what motivates us. This is all that we ask. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And the second is like that, love your neighbor as yourself. And all we are trying to do is show you how much God loves you in a real way. This man who speaks three languages and who was a philosophy major and who was brilliant. He was so intellectual, so intelligent. Stood there and he said, I don't even have words to explain what's going on in my head right now. I can't even tell you what I'm thinking. I've never had anybody do something like this because they want to show the love of God. Thank you. Now, I don't, I, I don't, I don't show this picture to you and I don't tell you this story so that Russell somehow gets glory because that's not what we did it for. We selfishly were going to Chipotle so that we could eat Chipotle for ourselves on the way of getting the supplies that we needed for the, the week ahead, the things that we have coming up. But while we were there, we saw this man in need and we felt overwhelmed that we needed to respond. We needed to do something without giving much thought to it, without knowing even the outcome or this man's need. Russell jumped into action and said, look, we just want to be able to serve you, man. How can we serve you? What is your greatest need? This man asked the question, why would you do this? What's in it for you? Every one of us needs to be able to ask and answer this question in our own lives. Why do you do the things that you do? Why, why, why do you treat people the way that you treat them? Why do you speak to people the way that you speak to them? Why do you spend money the way that you spend money? Why do you schedule things in your calendar the way that you schedule things in your calendar? As followers of Jesus, every decision we make should be predicated on the motivation that Jesus 
informs and influences every decision that we make. This is crucial for us. Jesus, as he's looking at the audience, he calls to attention their motivation when he says, look, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you. You're looking for a miracle. You're looking for something that is momentary, not because you understood the miraculous signs. You're here for a very selfish reason. Verse 27, he says, but don't be so concerned. If you look at this in the original language, and the concept is consumed, to literally consume you. Don't be so consumed or concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For the Father has given me the seal of approval. Something really cool here. Play on words talking about teaching and the different methods of teaching. That word seal, that word seal is indicative of the bakers of their culture and their context, like you and I today, when we go to any grocery store and we walk the aisles or we walk even the outsides, we will grab packaging from the shelves or from the coolers and they will have on there the name brand of the individual or the industry that produced what it is we're putting in our cart. It lets us know what the ingredients are. It lets us know the expiration date. It lets us know the value, if you will, of what we're putting in our cart. The same is true of this culture and context. They would, every day, the bakers would bake fresh bread and they would put a seal, a brand, if you will, on their product and it showed that it was authentic. It showed that it was fresh. It showed that they were the ones responsible for making this and that they could vouch for what they were presenting or what they were offering. Here, Jesus is speaking right to the culture and the context of what was going on. And he's talking to them about perishable, perishable things like food, that they're searching for something that is so, so temporary. They're searching for something that is so temporal. How many of you know what metabolism is? You might know the word, but do you really understand how metabolism works, how your body metabolizes food? There's a reason that about every three hours we feel hungry because every three to five hours, our body will metabolize whatever is in our stomach into our intestines. It will absorb the nutrients that is in whatever we are feeding our body and it will use it for energy. It will use it to fuel our brain. It will use it to fuel our bodies and whatever it cannot use, it will expel. And our body is in constant need of about every three hours, unless we are fasting, the period where our body, when we're sleeping generally, shuts down, our organs don't work as fast, our minds slow down, and our body isn't in need of as much energy. But when we are active, when we are moving, when we are on the go, our body is looking for energy about every three to five hours. That's why they call it a metabolism. Your body is metabolizing or breaking down. There's three types of metabolism, and, and there's a whole biology behind that. But what I need us to get out of this is that the way our metabolism works, the way our bodies work is that we are constantly searching for something to suffice us. The problem is when we take the same understanding and we apply it to our spiritual lives, we have a spiritual metabolism where we are constantly searching for someone or something to fill this void in our lives. And how many of us, if we're being really honest, we hang on to a message. We come on a Sunday and we're looking for a really good motivational speech, a, a message that will suffice us, that will give us enough energy, if you will, for the week. And then we come back the following week looking for a filling again. Or maybe if we're, if we're really good about being disciplined in our faith, we will We'll come on a Sunday and we'll get filled up and then we'll look for opportunities throughout the week, maybe to be involved in a life group at Reach Church or maybe to be in, involved in individual discipleship with somebody at Reach Church and we're looking to be filled. Or, or maybe we're going online and we're searching the world over for the latest and greatest theological voice. We're looking at the best theologians who can present the message in the most entertaining ways and we're hanging on to every one of those words. The problem is every single one of those things without the Savior is temporary. Jesus, Jesus speaks directly to, to the nature of what they're looking for 
and then shares with them what they should be looking for. He says, spend the, the second half of verse 27, spend your energy seeking, looking wholeheartedly for the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. It's authentic. It is food for your soul. It will fill you up. And it never expires. Verse 28. Listen to the reply of the people. The people who had just seen Jesus do this miracle. The people who had just eaten from Jesus' miracle. They replied, we want to perform. Man, church, if there is anything in all of scripture that breaks my heart, it literally might be this passage right here. I'm going to have you circle or underline or highlight three things right now. The first word is perform. We want to perform God's works too. That word work, circle or underline or highlight the S that makes it plural. What should we do? They replied, we want to perform God's works too. We want to perform we want to do what we can do to get where we want to go. And we're looking at specific works that we can do, that we can conjure up, that we can create so that we can be filled. We want to perform God's works too. Here in the middle of a relationship with Jesus, they are more focused on religion than anything else. And this is the danger with religion. Religion teaches all the things that we must perform or do. Several years ago, in fact, almost 15 years ago now, shortly after Stacy and I were married, I was helping a friend of mine who was a worship pastor in Vancouver, Washington, at a church called River Rock. Their pastor was doing a series called Frequently Asked questions, and there was a comparative religions question. There were several questions that were, they were addressing that people were asking about the differences between Christianity and other religions. And over the course of about six weeks, Jason, the worship pastor, and I, we got to go and interview several key leaders of other religions. I sat in as we recorded. Jason brought the audio visual recording equipment and I was the one getting to do the interviewing. He was the creative. I was the talkative. We went around and part of what we got to do was I got to interview the, uh, an imam, uh, the head of a, a Muslim mosque. And this is shortly after 9-11. That was intense. I got to interview a rabbi. Uh, an Orthodox rabbi, I got to interview a Hindu, I got to interview a Buddhist, a Buddhist priest, I got to interview, uh, Hare Krishna is really popular in the Northwest. We got to interview all these and we got to ask a lot of the, the same questions of each person and I will never forget when I went into Beaverton, Oregon to interview the head of, of a, a, a Hindu temple he invited us in and his whole house was filled with ornate gold and incense and ashes. And we spent about three hours there learning culturally about everything that they do and, and, and how they do it and why they do it, including why they put the, 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 the ink dots or the, it's actually like, a, like a, a burnt, it's like a burnt, I don't know, color, if you will, uh, on their forehead. It's, 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 it's intrinsically tied to their internal uh, knowledge and the enlightenment or Gnosticism. And we're going through this whole thing. And I started to ask this man, uh, I asked him what he thought about Jesus. What he thought about the person of Jesus as he was beginning to tell me about all the works that they perform and all the good that they did and all the, 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 how, the second life and what they're working toward. And he said, oh, we believe Jesus. Jesus is a good man. He's a good, good, good teacher. And then I said, well, that's awesome. I said, what do you believe about the Bible? And he said, oh, we believe in the Bible. We believe in the Christian Bible. It's a good book, just like all the other books. 
Then I said, so you believe in Jesus and you believe in the Bible. And he said, oh, yes, pastor, of course we believe in Jesus. We believe in the Bible. And I said, do you believe the Bible to be true? And he said, yes, we believe that the stories and the teachings in the Bible are true. And I said, well, what about John 14, 6, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This man, in his religious garb, stood up, and I will not repeat the words he used, but he said, oh, Andrew, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. You can't believe everything you read. <laughs> and I said, well... I just asked some clarifying questions. And then before we left, he had invited me personally to go with him over to India. And he was going to take me to several temples and show me the temples that were dedicated to different gods and goddesses and to experience his culture. It is amazing to me as I studied and as I learned and as I listened to these other individuals, all the similarities that they have in common. It's based on works. It's based on knowledge. It's based on sacrifice. It's based on religious exercises. It's based on saying the right words at the right time, facing the right direction, the right way every time. It's based on being good enough. The conflict with religion and a relationship with Jesus is while religion says it's based on all of these works that we must perform so that we can be good enough, the Bible says that none of us is good enough. In fact, the Bible says that our very best is little more than filthy rags in the eyes of God. The fortunate yet unfortunate part about that is there's nothing that any of us can do to be good enough. The Bible says there is not one good, no, not even one that's got to be really disappointing to hear for people who are self-sufficient. That's got to be really disappointing to hear for people who are used to accomplishing and doing things on their own to get the desired outcome that they have. The problem is when it comes to eternity, there is no room for God plus your works. It is God and God alone. And so these people come and they say, what works must we perform what must we do? And if I'm being honest, I see this even in Christian churches today. The danger lies in what prayer must we pray? What services must we attend? What events must we be involved with? What programs must we create? What songs must we sing? What should we do here? How should we spend our money there? And we are looking systematically at how the church operates and we are putting our faith and our value in those things. And yet even those things our meager offerings when it comes to what we must do or what's been done. Look here, verse 27. Don't be so concerned about these perishable things. Verse 28, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Now, verse 29, get your pins ready. Here's the third thing I want you to highlight. Jesus told them, this is the only work. Highlight, underline, and circle. In fact, if you're able to, right after the K, on the word work, circle how empty it is right there. It's missing an S. It is singular, not plural. This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, believe and confess. Believe in your heart and profess or confess with your mouth. That's it. You can't do what's already been done. It's up to you to receive that gift. There's nothing you can do to perform enough or do enough. What we are called to is to step out of religion and into a right relationship with Jesus. Believe in the one Jesus he has sent. Look at verse 30. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? How many of us are so busy chasing signs that we miss the Savior when he's right in front of us? How many of us are so busy chasing Jesus like he's a genie in a bottle that we miss the true nature of Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit right in front of us? As long as you're chasing signs, you will never experience the fullness of the Savior. But when you know the fullness of the Savior, you will begin to recognize all of the signs. Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? And now they're leaning on history. 
Look at this, verse 31. After all, our ancestors ate manna. Manna literally means what is it? They ate manna while they were journeying through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're trying to trip Jesus up and they're taking scripture out of context. Shocking. No one would ever take scripture out of context to make their point. You picked up that sarcasm I just put down? And I love what Jesus does. He doesn't chastise them, but he does rightly divide the truth and he shares with them. Jesus says in verse 32, I tell you the truth. And now he's going to dispel three lies that these individuals believe. He's going to dispel three lies that they have literally been hanging on to for their salvation. He says, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. Wrong. Eh. The correct answer is my father did. My father did. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift that we have comes down from the father of heavenly lights. It is God who is the one who gave you these things. Here's the second Here's the second lie that Jesus dispels. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. Offers. We'll look at that in a second. And the third one is the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. What Jesus does in short order is he talks about what, what God does. Or I'm sorry, what God did, what God does, and what God will do. What God did was provided the people miraculously manna from heaven when they had no other way of life. That's what God did. What God does, we see this, the second truth is what God does is he says, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven. Now what he's doing is he is providing authenticity through a right relationship rather than religion and will do. Here's the promise of what will happen. Verse 33, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That life, that regeneration is the promise of what will happen. This is an example of God unpacking for them the religion that they've been hanging on to and sharing with them the power of a right relationship with Jesus. They've been holding on to Moses. They've been holding on to their ancestors. They've been holding on to the pride of, of what has happened for centuries so much so that they, they take scripture out of context to make it fit within their own theological framework. And Jesus comes in and he says, no, 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 I'm sorry. Let me reframe, reframe these, th these three things for you. This is what God did. This is what God does. And this is what God will do. How many of us need to reframe our theology? How many of us are still chasing a sign when what we're called to chase is a savior? Jeremiah 29, 11, 12, and 13. Seek and you will find as long as you're looking wholeheartedly after God. Verse 34. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Can I just, can I translate this really simply for us? Lazy faith. They're not looking for the answer they're looking for a quick fix. Give us this bread every day. This is right in line with where the Samaritan woman was at when she had to come to the well every day, walking maybe upwards of miles in the heat of the day to draw water from the well for sustenance and life. Jesus is now speaking about truth with them and they are still concerned about what is temporary, what is temporal. And here's Jesus' reply, verse 35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. I know we did this a few weeks ago, but I want to do this again. Hold your finger here on John chapter 6 and turn all the way to the very front of your Bible. The very front of your Bible. The first book of the Bible in the Old Testament is Genesis. The next book is Exodus. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 3. It's not going to come up on the screen, so you're going to want to turn in your Bible. Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 12, 13, 14, and 15. You want to talk about history and heritage? You want to talk about knowing what your ancestors were about and where they came from? 
This is a group who knew, this was the original 23andMe. They knew where they came from, what their lives were like, what mattered most. They had memorized this stuff. Look at this. Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. But Moses, oh, I'm sorry, verse 12. God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Verse 13. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? Verse 14, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. This is Something that these individuals who have gathered collectively at the feet of Jesus are well aware of. And what Jesus is going to do in this teaching is he is going to set eternal life into motion by helping them understand who he is. When you and I understand all the more who Jesus is, we will then understand what he cares about what matters most to him, and we will allow it to inform our lives. If we don't, we will continue chasing the works that we can perform so that we think that we are somehow valued in the eyes of God or that we've done enough. But friends, when you and I come to the place where we understand who Jesus is, it will change everything about what we do. Here, Jesus says, right in line with Exodus chapter 3, Jesus says, I am. Who sent, who sent Moses? I am that I am. Who was going to deliver the Israelites? I am that I am. You tell them, I am the one who is going with you, before you. In other words, he is the life giver. He is. I am. Now, when Jesus says, I am, he is speaking to them on the nature of their knowledge, on their intellect. They know like they know like they know the person that God says he has been and has provided life for the Israelites in the middle of a desert. Jesus says, I provide life in the middle of your life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty, but you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of those he has given me, but I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. There's so much to unpack in that passage about God's chosen, about God's elect, about free will, and about what matters most, which is the last day. That God wants us as a people to be preparing for that last day. But how many of us, how many of us as we're budgeting for the year, are preparing our line items with eternity in mind. When Jesus comes back, as he promises, and we know that he is a promise keeper, there is no amount of money that you can set aside in your 401k or in your savings or in your assets that your kids will look at and say, oh, I'm so glad you left all that because it's going to mean nothing in eternity. When you are budgeting your line item, you're looking at your annual budget, do you have eternity in mind? Or are you, are you spending your energy with things here and now? And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be intentional about being good stewards of the resources that God gives us this side of heaven, but the other side of heaven or eternity should be what influences the decisions we make today. Hey guys, let me talk to you for a minute. Men, lean in for a second. All the guys in the room. I'm going to have a heart to heart with you right now. The way you interact with your wives and your daughters, are you treating them as your property, as your possessions, 
or as the promise of Scripture that they are being entrusted to you as daughters of the king and that your responsibility, my responsibility, is to prepare the bride for when the bridegroom comes. Are you using your wives and your children from what you can get from them or are you building into them so that they can be prepared all the more for the day of Christ's return? Sober thought, I know, but that is the reality of what we are called to. That is our responsibility. When you're rearing your children up, are you raising them to know and fear and trust the Lord? Because the Bible says that the greatest gift that we can give, and this is true from Israel from first century until today, is that the next generation will know, revere, and worship God even more than the last are your children and are my children seeing out of us and from us a heart that is desperately searching after God and that is seeking to serve him with every fiber of our being? When our children look upon us, do they learn, do they know how to worship God because of how you are worshiping God, how you live your life? Do they know what matters most because of how you and I budget our time? Do they know what matters most because of the words that come out of our mouths? The greatest lesson I ever learned about parenting came from Pastor Tom Hurt in Oregon City when he said, the greatest lessons our children ever learn are the ones that we're not teaching on purpose. The greatest lesson our children learn are the ones that we are not teaching on purpose. When you're budgeting your relationships, are you looking at people as relational equity and what you can get from them? How, how often, when was the last time, relationally speaking, financially speaking, spiritually speaking, you had somebody come to you and say, why would you ever do this? What's in it for you? And you were able to sit down and say, I'm doing this because I know the love of Jesus in my own life and it is my opportunity and privilege to share the love of Jesus with you. We may never see Nicholas again. We didn't get his number. He didn't, I don't think he has a phone. He didn't ask for our number. We didn't say, hey man, here's a, here's a pair of shoes. Here's the receipt. It's a gift receipt so you know how much we actually spent on these. Here's the socks so you know how much we spent on the socks. And here's a Reach Church journal so you know where we go to church and that we're pastors here. And, and here's a Bible with our Reach information on the inside. And, and we want you to, we're going to give you these shoes, but here's what we expect from you. None of that, none of that, none of that was a part of why we did what we did. When he asked that question, why would you ever do this? What he was asking is, what is motivating this? Our answer in that moment was simple. Because Jesus. Because Jesus. And I just, I want to believe somewhere in the back of my mind that every time this man laces up his shoes or puts on a new pair of socks for the next 12 days or he's walking and he looks down. I want to imagine that he'll remember when he asked the why, we were able to share the who, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Motivation matters. Every one of us is motivated Every last one of us is motivated. But it's up to us to answer this. Are you made, motivated by the what? Or are you motivated by the who? Are you motivated by the what? Or are you motivated by the who? Yesterday, and I'll finish with this. My son was annoyed. <laughs> I told my daughter, Brianne, I said, honey, if you score three goals, I'll give you two donuts. She scored one goal, but the team scored three goals. And she came afterward and she said, Daddy, Daddy, you scored three goals. And Caden said, well, you didn't, you scored one. She said, Daddy, can I have a donut? And I said, yeah, baby girl, let's go get a donut. And Caden said, oh, so participation award is all that matters right now. Good job, you tried real hard. He was annoyed. 
He was annoyed. And I said, no, what matters, what matters is that Brienne understands that the gift that she receives isn't because of anything that she did, but because I love her. He didn't have anything to say after that. What motivates us as followers of Jesus must, it must be the work. Not works, the work. Not that you and I perform, but that Jesus did. Once and for all, for all. And then you and I, as we come to understand that all the more, it's our privilege to allow that to inform everything else in our life. Father, I thank you for your teachings this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you teach us that you are the bread of life. And that when we come to you, we will never be hungry again. That as long as we're chasing the things of this world to fill us, we will metabolize those things and we will be left longing and wanting for more. But where we trust in you, we will never hunger again. Father, I pray that each and every last one of us this morning would come to the place of soul surrender to you and that our lives would never be the same again. Where we have been working really hard to be good enough, I pray that you would reveal that you are all that we need and that we could rest assured in that and allow you to inform everything that we say and do. Thank you, I am. Amen.